Welcome to the 21st century. My name is Marlon Maddox, and I'm host of the nationally syndicated radio news talk program, Point of View. You know, the new millennium is already proving to be a time of incredible progress in the areas of science and technology, and our scientists are racing to discover cures for a number of devastating diseases. Unfortunately, what should have been an incredible advancement for the human race has resulted in the creation of one of the most unthinkable industries imaginable, the multi-million dollar a year business of cutting up innocent babies and selling their parts for experimentation. For those who may be unfamiliar with this grisly practice, we'll show you how these modern day Frankensteins are able to not only circumvent the law, but to utilize your tax dollars in the process. In the 1990s, a new method of abortion was perfected by Dr. Martin Haskell of Dayton, Ohio. This procedure would become known as partial birth abortion. In this procedure, a baby, just seconds away from birth, is killed by a medical doctor in one of the most horrifying manners imaginable. In fact, partial birth abortion was so grisly that the American Medical Association refused to acknowledge it as a legitimate procedure. And when word of this gruesome practice leaked out, outraged Americans began contacting their representatives in Washington. Congress responded by voting to ban the procedure, not once, but twice. However, their bipartisan voices were ultimately silenced in both instances through vetoes by then-President Bill Clinton. As we'll see later, Clinton had more than just maintaining a woman's right to choose as his reason for keeping this procedure legal. In the first stage of the procedure, the abortionist is actually watching the baby on a TV screen using an ultrasound machine. This allows the abortionist to reach in with forceps and grab a baby, usually by a leg, turn the baby around, and begin to deliver the baby, while still alive, into the birth canal. At a certain point, the abortionist is able to grab the baby with his hands and continue to deliver the baby into the birth canal, everything except for the head. In this procedure, it is very important that the head not emerge from the womb because that, of course, would be a live birth under the law. So the doctor actually grips the baby in a certain way described in the paper to ensure that the head does not emerge as well as the body. Then at the point where the entire baby has been delivered alive into the birth canal, except for the head, the doctor takes a long surgical scissor, such as this one, or some other similar medical device, and thrusts it through the base of the baby's skull, as shown in drawing number four. This is generally what kills the baby. He removes the scissors, or the other puncturing instrument, and he inserts a tube, or a catheter. This tube is connected to a very powerful suction machine, which, when he turns it on, removes the baby's brain. This causes the skull to collapse, and the baby's head then emerges, completing the delivery of the dead baby. What determines whether or not you're a human being? Well, in the case of partial birth abortion, it has everything to do with location. Just think of it. As long as some portion of the baby remains inside the mother, it can be legally killed. Let's say the mother is lying here. Her baby has been pulled out of her womb about 80% of the way. Only the head remains inside. Did you know that according to a Supreme Court decision, this baby is not a human being. However, if the baby is moved about three or four inches this way so that the head is outside the womb, then it's considered a human being and is afforded all the rights and privileges guaranteed by our Constitution. Now think with me, is this logical? It'd be like saying, this is not a pencil, but if I move it over here, then now it's a pencil. The fact is, this is a pencil, 
whether I hold it here or whether I hold it here. And the baby is a human being, whether it's here or whether it's here. Now the liberal politicians, liberal members of the press, and liberal members of the entertainment industry would label me a dangerous right-wing extremist for saying what I just said. But I would say that puncturing a baby's skull and then sucking its brains out is extreme. What would you say? Is partial birth abortion any worse than any other abortion? Well, every abortion kills a living human developing baby. But this type of abortion is particularly gruesome. It's killing a baby during delivery. This is a medical model of a baby at four and a half months, 20 weeks. This is the earliest stage at which a partial birth abortion would generally be done. So this is the smallest the baby would be who is a victim of a partial birth abortion. Many are much larger. They called me up one day and asked me if I would work at the Women's Medical Center. And I told them I would because I didn't have a problem with abortion, or at least I didn't think I did. The first lady we did was 26 and a half weeks pregnant. She had just found out that her baby had Down syndrome. And her parents and her boyfriend made her get this abortion. She didn't want it. As a matter of fact, she cried the entire three days she was in there. So we did her first because she was upsetting the rest of the patients. And we brought her into the operating room and put the gown on her, put her on the table, put her legs in the stirrups. And we started an IV and gave her Valium just to calm her down so she wouldn't care what was going on. She didn't get a general anesthetic to knock her out. And I really thought those babies were dead at this point. I thought, they're not going to do this on a live baby, surely. They, you know, something's killed the baby. I don't know what I thought killed it, but they were very much alive and you could see the heartbeat. And taking a pair of forceps, he went up inside the cervix and into the uterus and found one of the baby's feet and turned the baby in utero because it wasn't headed feet first. He has to bring the baby out feet first. So he brought that foot down through the birth canal. Then he went up and he grabbed the other foot and he brought it down through the birth canal until he had both of the feet on the outside. And grabbing his little feet with his hands, he pulled the baby out of the mother for each position until he had the entire body, everything delivered except for the head. And as I stood there, this little baby was kicking his feet and moving his little hands and fingers, and very much alive. And the doctor's very careful to make sure that he holds the baby's head in with his two fingers, with his left hand, to make sure that that head doesn't slip out. Because if the head slips out now, three inches, three seconds, from being born, and he kills it, it's murder. But as long as he leaves that head in there, he's very careful to make sure that head stays there. It doesn't matter how he kills it. It's an abortion and it's legal in this country. And as I stood there in horror, I watched this. The doctor took a pair of scissors and into the back of the baby's neck, back here, he plunged those scissors. And when he did this, the baby jerked out in a startle reaction. And he took the scissors and he opened it up to make a hole in the back of the neck. And he took a high-powered suction machine and a catheter and he stuck that into the hole and he literally suctioned out the baby's brains. And they went down the tube and into a jar. And I almost hit the floor. I mean, I stood there and I thought, this isn't happening. This really isn't happening. I'm dreaming this. Please, wake me up. And I choked back the tears and the lump in my throat. And I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. I didn't want to be in there. But it, but it happened. He pulled the head out and he cut the cord and he delivered the placenta and threw it in the pan. And he cleaned her up and he took the baby out of the room. And this mom wanted to see her baby. We tried to talk her out of it, but she does have the right to see it. So we cleaned her up and put a pad on her and walked her to the ultrasound machine room. And we cleaned the baby up and put it in a little blanket and we handed it to her. And I don't know what she thought she was gonna see, but I don't think it's what she saw because she looked down in his little face and she started screaming to God to forgive her. And she held him and she rocked him and she begged him to forgive her. And at that point, I couldn't take it. I had to leave. I ran to the bathroom and beside a toilet, I kneeled and I screamed to God. And I said, God, why are you letting this happen? Why? Why does this have to happen? This is murder. I mean, I can't believe you'd allow this to happen. 
There were seven of these done that day. Every one of the mothers were perfectly healthy. Nothing was wrong with them. They just waited later in their pregnancy to have an abortion. One baby had Down syndrome. The rest of them were perfectly healthy babies. The vast majority of partial birth abortions are performed uh, for purely elective reasons. Uh, they're performed on the healthy mothers of healthy babies. Those are the facts. The abortionists don't want to admit that, but that's the reality of partial birth abortion in this country. How does stabbing the child in the back of the head protect the mother? That's just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. I know of no uh, disease, uh, no congenital anomaly where this type of procedure would be necessary in order to preserve the mother's health or to save her life. And it certainly doesn't do anything for the life of the baby. The partial birth abortion method is not recognized by the medical community. It's not found in any textbook. Matter of fact, the reason that it's not recognized is because it puts women's health and their reproductive chances at great risk. It does not lessen their risk for having problems. It increases their risk for having problems with future pregnancies. You have to do what the older obstetricians called a podalic version. Reach into the uterus, find the baby's feet, turn the baby around in the uterus, extract the feet in a breech delivery, and then just before the head is delivered, destroy the baby's life by sucking out its brain. Just that podalic version alone is a very serious threat to the future of that mother's uterus. And so rather than preserving that woman's fertility, I think very likely this which would very seriously threaten her future fertility. The abortion industry claimed that this was a very rare procedure done only a few hundred times a year and only in the most extreme medical necessity. And much of the major news media adopted that claim and presented it to the American people as fact. It turned out, it, it, in fact, it was known all along for those who actually investigated the matter, that these claims were false, that partial birth abortions are done thousands of times a year, that the vast majority of these are done on healthy babies of healthy mothers. The procedure involved in this case is extremely rare. It involves tragic and traumatic circumstances late in pregnancy in cases where the mother's life or health is in danger. They are rare. They are exceptional. They are there because a woman's life and health is in danger. So what is before us is a bill to outlaw a medical procedure that is rare, that is used in the most tragic circumstances. In fact, these abortions take place only when the life or health of the woman is at risk. The public out there has no clue of what's going on behind these closed doors. They just hear abortion, well, abortion's a woman's right, you know, she has a right to do what she wants to with her body. It wasn't her body they was doing it to, it was those little tiny babies that they were doing it to. And it was just incredible. I don't think I will ever get over seeing those babies move and flinch from the pain that was being inflicted in them. And then looking down into that little boy's face. If I've ever seen an angel, it was that day. Some have likened this chart to a depiction of an appendicitis operation. My God. Appendicitis. That's not an appendix. That's not a blob of tissue. It is a baby. It's a baby. According to the courts of the United States, and this is true of Canada also, you're allowed to kill the baby as long as the baby gets dead before he comes out into the air. But in this procedure, the baby is alive until the head is pierced. But sometimes, at that point, she gives a big uh, pop, out comes the head. Now you have a live child in your arms. What do they do? Well, they don't publicize this, of course, but they take the baby and put him in a bucket of water and drown him. Ignoring the law, which requires that at least some portion of the baby remain inside the mother before it's killed, 
A new type of abortion has quietly developed behind the scenes in recent years and has become known as the live birth abortion. In this scenario, late-term mothers are given the drug Cytotec, which causes the woman to go into labor. In many cases, babies are born alive and although frequently premature, could survive if given proper medical attention. However, keep in mind that the whole purpose of any abortion is to kill the baby. And should a baby happen to survive the process, then the procedure is considered a failure. So the babies are simply left on the table to die. According to sworn testimony of attending nurses, these types of aborted babies have been known to survive for up to eight hours, all the while moving and gasping for air. Now we've gone from the partial birth abortion to something called the live birth abortion. Congress held hearings on this in the summer, and we learned that at certain Chicago area hospitals, doctors are inducing labor for the purpose of delivering a premature baby, which is then wrapped in a surgical towel and stuffed on a counter in a laundry room or some other unused room and left until the baby dies. I mean, this is barbaric. Abortions never stop. They get broader and broader. And now the most recent one that we found out about is what they call therapeutic abortions or live birth abortions. Some people think, well, this is just an emergency method where a mother has to have an abortion to save her life. Not true. These are elective abortions. And this is simply means that a doctor induces labor. The baby is born. Sometimes they die during labor, but many times they live through that labor. And here you've got a living baby, a live birth abortion, and they give it what they, they call comfort care, where the mother or the nurse, if there's a nurse available, will literally hold that baby wrapped up in a blanket in their arms until that baby breathes its last breath. It is not given any nourishment or any medical attention. Now, if there's no, no one available and the mother doesn't care to hold the baby, they'll sometimes put it back in a storage room on a shelf and the baby is left to die there. One of the things that you would think is, well, isn't that illegal? Shouldn't somebody have to be held accountable for that? And the answer is no. They look at what the mother's intention was. The mother's intention was to create a dead baby. And that's what happened. And so the, the law's attitude when we've talked to them uh, in the places where this is going on is, you know, this, is, this was the mother's intention. It was her choice. She was entitled, basically, to a dead baby. She got a dead baby. What's the problem? And this is just a natural extension of, of the abortion mentality. The most telling conversation on the floor of the United States Senate occurred during the debate on the partial birth abortion bill. Rick Santorum asked California's Barbara Boxer when she would protect a child once he or she had been delivered. And Barbara Boxer said, well, when it goes home from the hospital. And Rick Santorum said, you don't mean that. And she said, well, when it's in the mother's arms. And then he said, what about when it's in the doctor's arms? And she wouldn't answer him. It was chilling. The media has done a great job in keeping this subject hidden from the American people. They don't want us to know about it because of the outrage. And there is an outrage on this subject when you talk about therapeutic abortions, a live birth abortion, people can't believe this is going on. But it's such groups as NARAL, those pro-abortion people who put great pressure on the media to keep this subject quiet. Don't let it get out. The live birth abortion has become the method of choice since the attending doctor doesn't even have to be there. Everything can be handled by the nurses and residents. The doctor doesn't have to get his hands dirty by sucking out the baby's brains. More importantly, this procedure leaves the baby's brain intact for later resale. You see, the early abortions tear the baby's body in pieces, and then the organs aren't uh, saleable, should we say. One of the big reasons we think they are fighting so hard to keep this type of abortion legal is that it delivers an intact body. 
And now they can dissect this out. And here's the liver, and, and here's a hind quarter, and, and here's the thymus gland, and so forth. And of course, if they're born alive and then killed, then they didn't suck the brains out, and they can sell the brains. On January 22, 1993, within 48 hours of being sworn in, Bill Clinton's first official act as president was to revoke the ban on taxpayer-funded fetal tissue research. Later that year, the Health Revitalization Act made it a felony for abortion clinics to sell pieces of aborted babies to pharmaceuticals and government agencies which were demanding them. However, in typical Washington fashion, an intentional loophole was built into the law, allowing third parties to serve as brokers for the baby parts. Mark Crutcher explains. There are federal laws which, which prohibit the sale of human body parts, both fetal and, and adult. And that's true, but these people who market in, in unborn children have figured a little loophole around that. When you order a part from them, if you order a, a, uh, a baby's left leg, you technically are not paying for the leg. You're paying for the labor to remove the leg. You'll never get one of these people to say, yes, I'll sell you a leg off of a baby or a, a heart or the brain or the head or whatever it is that, that you need to buy for your research. They're never going to say that. What they say is, you reimburse me for the labor. Oh, by the way, I get to set my own labor rates. And we saw when we did our financial investigation of this thing that uh, a lot of money is being made on it. In 1994, the Anatomic Gift Foundation was formed to serve as a harvester for baby parts. AGF staff members would go into abortion clinics such as Planned Parenthood, cut up the aborted babies within minutes after their death, and ship the pieces on ice either by UPS or Federal Express to those agencies who had sent in purchase orders. Former President Clinton's continued support for the process along with his vetoes overriding the partial birth abortion ban, allowed the baby parts industry to flourish while helping AGF's revenue skyrocket from $180,000 per year to more than two million in its first four years of operation. During the last presidential campaign, we were led to believe by some that there really wasn't a lot a president could do about abortion one way or the other. We'll just go back and look at some of the things that Clinton did. He lifted the ban on abortions in military hospitals. He lifted the ban on the so-called family planners for using our tax dollars to hustle for their abortion businesses. He lifted the import alert on RU486. He appointed two hardcore pro-abortion advocates to the Supreme Court and hundreds more to the federal bench. And most importantly, he lifted the ban on the use of our tax dollars for fetal tissue research. That's why we have this trafficking in baby parts that is going on right now. Our organization is the one that, that broke the story about there being companies in America that go into abortion clinics and buy the dead bodies of babies who are then chopped up and sold to research companies, medical universities, pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, and that sort of thing. And this has now started a big debate over the use of fetal tissue. I find it incredibly hypocritical that there are people who say, oh, I'm pro-choice, but I find that horrible, that's, that's barbaric. If there's nothing wrong with killing the baby, or if you believe it isn't a baby, then what's wrong with this? The other thing is, where does this lead to? Are we going to have a situation where women are going to get pregnant on purpose? Are they going to become basically uh, farms for tissue, for unborn babies? They get pregnant, have a baby, sell that baby for medical research, and uh, have it killed. Again, if there's nothing wrong with abortion, what's wrong with that? This brochure, produced by the organization Opening Lines, one of the competing companies which sells baby parts, states that, quote, our goal is to offer you and your staff the highest quality, most affordable, and freshest tissue prepared to your specifications and delivered in the quantities you need when you need it. Only the healthiest babies, which are referred to as product, are used. One look at the opening line's price list should convince anyone that we're not simply dealing with the blob of tissue that pro-abortionists would have us believe are being aborted. 
For example, anyone can purchase spleens for $75, livers for $150, kidneys for $125, arms and legs for $150. An intact brain goes for $999, the heart and lungs for $150, or spinal cords for $325. And of course, the larger the baby, the more money it generates. Basically, we found uh, four or five what we call players in this, in this business where, that are involved, the basically wholesalers, people who buy the dead bodies and then turn around and resell them to, to uh, pharmaceutical companies and so forth. The two main players appeared to be a company called Opening Lines and Anatomic Gift Foundation. Now, the interesting thing is that when we started revealing this information to the public, both of these people ran for the hills. Uh, the day that we released the information and it made the first newspaper, one of them shut down that day. Um, the other one hung on for a little bit longer but then eventually said that they were going to get out of the fetal tissue business as well. Which raises several questions. If that's such a noble thing to do, you know, why do you run for the hills just when somebody shines the light on it and says, this is what you're doing? The other thing is we know that in at least one instance, uh, this company has set up now under another name in another state and is clandestinely back involved in this. But there are other companies, uh, there's several of them that have stayed in it all along. The harvesting of baby parts has been going on for a long time. I remember when we first found out about it and we heard that at night they were slipping out these baby parts out of a warehouse so that nobody would be aware that they were doing this. Well now, of course, it's much more open. It's a very lucrative trade. After all, if you can sell an intact brain for a thousand dollars. Do you want eyeballs? They're a hundred dollars a piece. There's a lot of money transplanting here and a lot of drug companies are doing experiments using these tissues and the almighty dollar goes there. By law a mother must sign a consent form before her baby's parts can be used for research. The opening lines brochure instructs abortion clinic counselors on how to best sell a prospective patient on the idea of donating her aborted baby to opening lines for resale. It states, quote, your patient has the ability to give permission to donate fetal tissue for research. That consent may result in the saving of lives of possibly thousands of people. Great strides are being made with respect to treating and curing many disorders such as cancer, AIDS, Alzheimer's, liver disease, eye disorders and blindness, diabetes, spinal cord injuries, kidney disease, and countless other diseases. When patients think of all the good that could come from this research, the decision becomes quite easy. The people who are involved in it now are trying to use it as basically kind of a sales tool, a subtle sales tool to women who may be ambivalent about their abortion decision. You know, if you, if you go in there and you're, you're and as, as most women are, very ambivalent, you're, this is not something that you wanted to do. No, no little girl when she's three or four or five, ten years old says, one day I want to grow up and have an abortion. No woman wants an abortion. So if, um, if you go in there and you're thinking about it, you know, the fact that somebody says to you now, did you know that your baby's body could go to help cure AIDS or cure Parkinson's or whatever? You know, I'm not saying that would push her over to saying, oh, okay, great, then let's go ahead. But it's got to be one of those factors that makes it a little more palatable for her to go forward with the abortion. A closer look at a number of purchase orders sent to Planned Parenthood requesting fetal tissue indicates that the sacrificed babies are not always used for high purposes. This request for a 12 to 15 week old liver by the New England Primate Center indicates plans for implantation into a monkey in the hopes of creating a human-monkey chimera or hybrid. We are seeing experiments and we're certainly hearing stories of animal-human hybrids. In other words, you're taking some human tissue and planting it in mice or something of that sort. That's Frankenstein-type stuff. Because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done. And we have to continue to say, look, the human body is, is a sacred thing, and we can't simply 
create monsters. We have to watch scientists. As evidence of the baby parts trafficking industry began to spread, Congress could no longer ignore the public outcry. On November the 9th, 1999, a resolution was adopted calling for congressional hearings into the matter. While pro-life conservatives applauded the move, pro-abortion liberals busily prepared for battle. In response to the publicity of selling baby parts, there were hearings in the U.S. Congress industry. And what came out of it was just a fiasco. Uh, we had hoped that that would reveal what was going on. As a matter of fact, the press did not cover it. They're in favor of selling body parts, most of them. And um, we really didn't get much out of it. On March the 9th, 2000, the hearings began. What was supposed to blow open the illegal trade in baby parts quickly degenerated into a public ambush of whistleblower Dean Alberti, former tissue procurement technician for the Anatomic Gift Foundation. Well, the hearing in Congress on the trafficking of baby parts fell apart because the members who had arranged the hearing, who really wanted to get to the bottom of this, did not know that their star witness, Dean Alberti, had been sued by his company. When he went to work for the company, he had signed a confidentiality agreement, and he broke that agreement by revealing all of this damaging information to Mark Crutcher. Under the terms of the agreement, he was under a gag order. He was not supposed to talk about the lawsuit. The other side brought up the lawsuit, and he was terrified. He didn't know if by talking about it in the hearing, he would be in violation and therefore would be subject to being sued again. So the hearing fell apart. His credibility was undermined. You see, it was necessary to destroy Mr. Alberti's reputation in order to keep the baby parts trafficking industry intact. Since the government is a major participant in the whole operation, both in terms of funding it and in receiving fetal tissue, why would they want it stopped? Once again, congressional hearings were used, not as a search for truth, but as part of a political agenda. Why do you think our congressmen are not really strong on passing laws to ban this? Well, because many of them are reaping the benefits from the pharmaceutical houses. I mean, they are big supporters of these uh, politicians. And friends, it's all about money. It's all about winning the next election. And we are becoming victimized by such industries as this for political reasons. We do know that government agencies have been involved, pharmaceutical houses have been involved. Certainly the abortion industry is deeply involved in this. You know, we Americans are wondering, why would congressmen like Henry Waxman work so hard to destroy Alberti's credibility and, and prop up this horrendous industry? And I think the answer is that these congressmen receive huge campaign contributions, not only from the pharmaceutical companies, but from the abortion industry itself. And the abortion industry wants to perpetrate the idea that somehow you can benefit humanity by sacrificing your baby. There's an argument out there that goes like this. Well, these babies are gonna be killed in abortion anyway. That's a waste. Why not put some of these organs to use and help mankind? Well, let's flip back 50 years ago. Nazi doctors, trials of Nuremberg, and these doctors justified the experiments that they did on humans, on Jews and others, that this was going to help mankind. They hanged those doctors at Nuremberg. Despite headlines and claims to the contrary, fetal tissue research has produced very few tangible results. In fact, as University of Toronto neurologist Paul Rinaldi says, a magnifying glass is required to discern any functional benefit. A 52-year-old Parkinson's sufferer received a fetal tissue transplant in his brain and within two years died from complications. 
The fetal tissue, it was discovered, had grown wildly into hair follicles, skin, cartilage, and other debris causing his death. In fact, there's not been much, um, shall we say, scientific progress made. Uh, they've been trying to inject brain tissue into patients with Parkinsonism. And almost every year we hear of a new, ah, wonderful cures. Well, you follow those people a year later and they're back to where they were. Recently, the first full-scale trial of implanting fetal tissue into the brains of Parkinson's sufferers was conducted, and the results were horrendous. While some patients experience little or no benefit from the treatment, others receive permanent side effects, far worse than the disease itself, including uncontrollable writhing and twisting, violent head jerking and unintelligible speech. Some side effects were so severe, patients could no longer eat and required feeding tubes. Doctors involved in the experiment described the results as, quote, absolutely devastating, tragic, catastrophic, and a real nightmare. Nevertheless, they plan to continue using fetal tissue in their search for a cure. There's a lot of pressure put on this subject today by those celebrities who've got physical problems. And my heart does go out to them because when you're hurting and when you've got a disease, you're looking for every means possible to try to get help yourself. But we should not even consider using human parts from another little baby. Why are we ignoring the real progress that has been made in other areas from taking core blood from umbilical cords and from taking stem cells from consenting adults and babies who are born where it does no harm? There are many areas of research that are worthwhile and should be supported, but using the parts of aborted babies is not one of them. We are being told that there are certain experiments that need doing that can only be done with fetal tissue from aborted babies. That's just not true. We can do almost everything with adult tissue. And there is a source of fetal tissue also. Babies die of natural causes. Babies die of miscarriages. Uh -huh. There's reasons why you can't use some of those. They aren't normal babies. But there are tubal pregnancies, for instance. Now, those babies die of natural causes, and those tissues can be used. As a culture, we can't look at this medical research, this, this uh, fetal tissue research, and tell ourselves that how this tissue is acquired is irrelevant, because it is the most relevant issue. If I'm a scientist and, and I'm doing some research and somebody brings me uh, a fetal pancreas, the first question I'm going to ask myself is, how did that pancreas come to be dead? Was this baby killed on purpose? Or was this baby the result of a spontaneous miscarriage? And the moment we keep ignoring that, we start ignoring that, which is what we're doing now, um, it, it's just one more example of how. Americans were shocked when Princeton University hired Peter Singer and gave him an important position in bioethics at the university. Now here is a man who believes that personhood should be withheld until a child is 30 days old to make sure he or she measures up. Peter Singer has said, and he has his followers, that we not only can do abortions, but that we can't always pick up the quote bad ones before they're born. And so what we should do is have sort of a celebration when the baby is a month old. And we would gather together and we will have examined this child and will have said, well, uh, this kid doesn't measure up to our elitist standards of perfection, therefore we'll kill the child. But this one is a good one, so we'll let this one live. And he's suggesting that we have this ceremony at one month of age. Now, this is terrible. This is Nazi stuff all over again, many times worse. Now you have these people coming forward saying, you know, birth is kind of an arbitrary point to cut off a woman's right to choose. 
Um, I think that parents should be allowed to have a few extra days. And now you ha we have a, a deposition from an abortionist here in our office who said that up to about a month, he wouldn't have any problem killing a baby outside the womb. So let's, let's let these babies go ahead and be born, let the parents look at them, bond with them or not bond with them, check them out, see if they're healthy. Um, you know, if you wanted a, a girl and it turns out to be a boy, then you can, you know, have the boy killed. Or uh, if you wanted one with blonde hair and it looks like it's going to have brown hair, its eyes aren't blue or whatever, whatever the reason, let's give parents, and you have these guys out there openly saying, let's give parents the right to make a decision in the first 30 days of the, the baby outside the womb that they would have had the previous 30 days in the womb, when it was in the womb. Why cut it off at birth? And see, that is the, that's the salient point of this whole argument about abortion. The moment that you drift away from the position that a life begins at conception, then every other point is strictly arbitrary. For those who may find this talk of killing newborns hard to believe, consider this. On January 17, 2001, with just three days left in his administration, Bill Clinton signed a federal regulation which redefined all newborn children as, quote, fetuses. The law, when put into effect, would legalize the killing of selected newborns and allow their bodies to be used in scientific research. This is a tiny human, and from that very first cell stage, Abortion, by whatever technology or technique, kills a living human. Do we have the right to kill our brother, our sister, no matter how small or no matter how old they are? And those of us who are in the pro-life movement keep trying to say, no, you can't do this. When you kill the first one, you have start slippery slope. It will be an uphill fight and all abortions. We've had it too long. People are just, if I get pregnant, I have an answer. And uh, today we need to really roll up our sleeves and get involved to educate other people about what abortion is, what it really does. Human life should have a price tag that is beyond value. And only when all of us are safe are all of us safe. But when you say this life has only a relative value and you hang a price tag on it and you say, but you can't kill this one for this reason, no longer is life an absolute value. No longer is it sacred. And price tags get marked down. Over the past three decades since Roe v. Wade, abortion has really changed. It never stands still. It gets broader and broader. I remember the day that we reached 20 million babies aborted. And we were all appalled and just brokenhearted, 20 million. And then the number rose to 30 million. And now today, we're told it's over 40 million. Where will it all end? It will not end until you and I decide that this is enough. And we set out to educate our young girls, our young women, and our legislators that abortion is killing a baby. It's not a woman's choice, it's killing a baby. If left unabated, the grisly practice of cutting up and selling will continue. Life will be cheapened, the Constitution's protection of life will be undermined, and human rights will grow. We need your help. Every one of us has to become a part of the solution to the problem. This is an issue about life, you about death. It concerns you, your family, your children, your grandchildren. We all have a responsibility to educate ourselves, educate our families, educate our co-workers. We also have a responsibility to put pressure on the politicians in Washington, D.C. for them to stop the grisly practices that we've discussed in this video. We've given you the information. We've told you factually what's going on in America today. And the rest 
is up to you.